Welcome to Bad Shit, a frank and funny look at living with mental illness. While we'll touch on several illnesses, Bad Shit is focused on those along the spectrum of bipolar disorders. Hey, I'm your host, Adam. Hey, I'm your host, Brad. And we're both bipolar, so strap in, let's see how bad shit we really are. Spoiler alert, pretty damn bad shit. Oh! Oh, the voices, man, the voices. <laughs> it makes me smile. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this, uh, episode's topic is bipolar and how it affects your sleep. That can include depression, that can include mania, that can include all the other, uh, ancillary, uh, mental disorders you may find within your cracked up brain. Uh, and because of this, we have a super cool guest, uh, Dr. Katie Carlson. Uh, that's right, guys. I know a fucking doctor. <laughs> ha! Suck it! Um... Katie, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Dr. Katie Carlson. I am a trauma psychologist or a trauma clinical psychologist um, by training. And right now, um, after working with my patients for a very long time and noticing that most people with trauma have some sort of comorbid sleep disorder, I got really interested in treating sleep disorders. So um, right now, I am a psychologist at the VA, which is the Veterans Affairs Hospital here in LA, and I work on research studies treating people with comorbid um, insomnia or sleep tr um, sleep troubles, as well as PTSD. Wow, that's uh, that's a lot of stuff, Katie. <laughs> I also specialize in substance use treatment, they, so catch me anywhere. Oh my god, so we're gonna have to have Katie on a bunch of episodes yeah. because it covers a whole bunch of topics that we need to talk about. Um, so. You you, you have a disclaimer you have to do. Oh, oh yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Here we go. Um, so um, my disclaimer is that my views are my own and are not representative of the United States government. There you go. Cool. <laughs> so now we're in the that's, clear. That's Perfect. the same for us, too. It, it was, oh, really? okay. Yeah, yeah. it's important. Yeah. I suppose that's true, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, good God. Uh, there's too many. Uh, we're not a political podcast. Anything we say on here is non-political. Blibbity blah blah blue If you're listening to this podcast, I think you've picked up on that by now. <laughs> Um, so one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, Katie, is because Brad and I have both talked about sleep and how the lack thereof or sometimes the feeling of needing an unattainable amount of it, mm. we feel like is oftentimes associated with depression slash bipolar slash a lot of other mental illnesses that aren't really discussed. Sure. So uh, I know a lot of our listeners suffer from sleep problems, and so... I want to start with what drove you or what drew you, not, not drove, it's not a car, what drew <laughs> you to studying this as a field of study? Uh, psychology in general or sleep? Uh, let's go with sleep. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's like psychology. You just want to analyze Sh people. I get that. <laughs> sure. Again, yeah, I was, um, so again, I'm a trauma therapist by training. Um, and so I was working with a lot of people with pretty severe PTSD, uh, particularly combat veterans and then, um, survivors of sexual violence and sexual assault is what I was treating. Um, and a lot of times I was noticing that while some of their PTSD symptoms were getting better, their sleep was not, and they would be reporting either really bad nightmares or night terrors or just not being able to sleep. Mm. Um, and when people are not able to sleep, their whole well-being suffers. So not only were some symptoms of PTSD or depression just really lingering, but then they're just chronically fatigued and how you navigate the world when you're exhausted all the time really blows. Yeah. And so I started wondering, how do you treat two things at once? How do you get somebody who's um, really traumatized and having really severe PTSD symptoms? How do you help with that? And you have to sometimes treat things at the same time. Like I mentioned, also um, interested in treats and treat substance use disorders. But I was like, hey, we got to we got to help them with their sleep. Um, and that was and then once we started doing that, I started noticing that it was easier for them to engage in mm -hmm. PTSD therapy, which is pretty difficult. And it, it requires a lot of people to engage in that. And it's hard and scary. Um, but when they're sleeping well, they're doing better and able to have the energy, the motivation, um, the cognitive ability to actually step into the hard work that is healing from trauma well th and that's a big part of it right is like how are you expected to fight any of these problems if you're too tired to fight exactly you know exactly it's like, it's like you're trying to overwork a muscle it's you know it's like you, you're not going to be able to do that by the way guys my dog is literally exhaling outside of the door because uh the, re the way i met katie is she is 
her dog is best friends with my dog, <laughs> um, which is how a lot of weird contacts in L.A. happen. And so he's literally trying to bash down the door. So if you hear that, sorry. Um, but yeah, that's actually a big thing we talk about on the show is that there's no solution mm-hmm. for this, for yeah. any disorder. There's no solution for you know, being bipolar. You just have to keep fighting. Mm-hmm. And you need every weapon available to you to fight. And a big part of that is having a rested body and mind. And now sleep deprivation mm-hmm. can lead to psychosis, right? It absolutely can, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, how, to what degree, not to what degree does a psychosis happen, how much sleep deprivation needs to occur before that, like, you reach that level? Ooh. So that would be a question that actually I would have to review the literature on to get an exact number, but it would have to be quite a bit over an extended period of time. Yeah. Like, if you're, you're only sleeping a few hours a night, that's not going to give you psychosis at any time in the near future. I'm talking, like, if you've gone without sleep... 48, 72 hours and do that consistently, um, weeks on like weeks or every few weeks that might lead to psychosis, but otherwise not having enough sleep, um, any given night is not going to give you psychosis. Do you see psychosis quite a bit in your patients? Um, that's not my area of specialty. I definitely have had patients with that. Um, but once you get to the, like the level of like specialization that we do as clinical psychologists, we typically refer out if it's not like our exact area. Mm-hmm. So yes, I've seen it, um, but not in any like like expertise capacity. Gotcha. You know what's interesting with that is. Um, you were you were saying before we started recording that there's not been a lot of research done with sleep amongst bipolar patients. Mm-hmm. Psychosis is one of the the big symptoms that happens usually with bipolar one, but also sometimes with bipolar two. But in periods of mania, uh, bipolar one patients can go as much as a week without sleep. Absolutely. And I've never seen those two things directly linked in in my research. Obviously. I'm not a doctor. (laughs) uh, Despite that white coat you're always wearing. (laughs) But they treat them as two separate symptoms. Mm -hmm. When to me, it seems, it seems like the obvious um, cause and effect is that the psychosis comes from the lack of sleep. Mm -hmm. Theoretically. Yeah. Yeah. Theoretically. Yes. There's so much that can cause psychosis. There's genetic, um, vulnerability to that. Um, uh, actually substance use. Uh, a lot of people have their first psychotic episode after indulging in substances, which is a bummer. Um, even if there's just like a low dose of recreational, um, there hasn't been a ton of research linking it exactly to sleep loss or debt. Um, but there is a, like a fine line. That's so much of psychology is in kind of a gray area. And you think about all these are constructs, right? There's something that somebody made up, mm-hmm. you know, looking at these are like, in the DSM five symptom criteria. Um, but these constructs often overlap. So there is overlap between mania and psychosis, but they're, yeah, they are separate constructs and it makes it really gray and confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for people who don't go to seven years of graduate school and are trying to live with this, you know, it's hard to understand. And I imagine it's a constantly evolving field of study. Absolutely. Yeah. um, We don't know what the hell we're talking about. Uh, And Katie is learning as she goes because, again, it's constantly evolving, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, Well, it's like we've come across a lot of symptoms that not only we've experienced, but seem to be common Mm -hmm. that aren't listed in, say, the DSM-5. Ooh. Sure, sure. Like memory issues that we've talked about a lot that seem to be incredibly common, but that's not listed as a symptomatic criteria. Yeah. Tell me more. What kind of memory issues? Well, so like, for instance, I don't remember a majority of my childhood. Like it's, uh, there are the, so we all have those moments in high school and grade school that are, you know, imprinted on our mind for all times. You know what I mean? But aside from those moments, I don't remember my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I know pretty definitively that I did not have an abusive childhood. Like I was not abused by my parents. I, I had a relatively uh solid upbringing you know comfortable enough but at the same time can't remember Mm -hmm. can't remember um i also cannot remember my dreams i it feels like i never dream i listened to that on your eyes sleep podcast that you did earlier this year Mm -hmm. i remember you saying that and it's again like these aren't things that are that are listed as symptoms Mm -hmm. but it's something that 
we and a, a lot of our listeners have commented about. Yeah. Do you want to talk about your experience of memory, memory loss, Brad? For me, it, it occurs during mania. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I'll come out of a manic episode, and there, there are entire days that I don't remember. I have no idea what I did. Um, and that's something I've come across a lot, just finding threads with other people who are bipolar discussing it Um, and it gets kind of scary i mean there was a woman i'd read about who uh had engaged in risky sexual behavior and didn't remember it Mm -hmm. right and that's frightening it totally is yeah Yeah. now this is going to be a very you know not a stupid question there are no stupid questions um how do you quant? how do you get a symptom on on the uh in the DSM? Yes. Thank yeah, you. yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the DSM is also constantly evolving and changing. There's been many iterations of it throughout time. Um, but it's, it's committees, like, like most other things. Um, mm-hmm. You get a field of experts together who are experts in that disorder and treating that disorder. And they meet and talk about it for typically years. Um, and they, years? Yeah, they debate and talk about it and come up with a list and um, go from there. So it is quite the undertaking. Um, but there's subcommittees, basically, um, mm-hmm. that go into making it. Interesting. So they must get have to get a ton of examples of these repeating symptoms in order to even bring it up in committee. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. And then um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of the ICD-11. Or is that something you've heard of? No. no. Okay, so the DSM, is, the DSM-5 um, is our like mental health disorders textbook, so to speak, or manual mm. um, in the United States. The ICD-11 is that internationally. Um, oh. So the ICD-11 is what hospitals use. I think if you were to be hospitalized for any reason, that's what's coded. Um, and they use that to actually diagnose and code um, in like your note-taking system. Um, but there's an international, and there's actually a poll in our community in this in the field of psychology to actually be using the ICD-11 um, more. And I could see that happening in the next several years. Why do we fucking do that? Well, that's a great question. Like, America first, not listening to the rest of the world? You know? Did you see that Saturday Night Live sketch with George Washington? No. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's basically George Washington, he's got a bunch of soldiers around, and he's like, we're fighting... So that we can make sure that we use gallons <laughs> instead of liters. Right. And then one of the guys is like, how many liters is in a gallon? And no one knows. <laughs> yeah. That was a great sketch. Yeah. That's so fucking stupid. It's so infuriating. Um, yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna deviate like that. But um, <laughs> it's too easy. It's too easy to go down that rabbit no, hole. It's the, it's the ICD eleven. Yeah, yeah. I can send you guys a link. It's free for everyone to access on the internet. That's right. We're the we d- can put it in our our show notes. Yeah, so absolutely. Click on it. Do you find that there's a lot of differences between that and the DSM five? You know, I actually don't know the differences for bipolar, for trauma. I'm like again, that's kind of my area. And sleep, there are some differences, um, particularly with trauma and like the. I know you guys have talked about complex PTSD or CPTSD yep. on your podcast before. Um, the ICD-11 delves into that, where the DSM doesn't touch uh, complex trauma or CPTSD. Wow. So, and see, I don't, I don't get that. Um, you know, when we had uh, Lauren Malisi on, mm-hmm. who uh, has borderline personality disorder, Ooh, right. mm-hmm. she talked about how a lot of doctors didn't even recognize that, that she right. spoke to. I wonder if that's... Uh, one of the differences between the two. I also wonder is is uh, is it? I'm sorry, I already forgot. I ICD ICD. Is it more comprehensive? Is it more inclusive of smaller symptoms or disorders or you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I would classify it as more comprehensive necessarily. Maybe I'd have to look more into it. Um, but it definitely expands and changes the criteria for certain disorders. Mm. Um, like again, like I, I keep going back to trauma because that's where I my house is. And right. yeah, but. Um, so the criterion A of like what you need to meet to qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD is much more expansive and mm. um, in the ICD-11. But interesting. Well, you keep mentioning uh, trauma and sleep. So um, obviously, we can't get into the trauma that uh, your patients have experienced. Or, uh, but can you give us a general idea of how? 
it, it, do you find that it's it's mostly because of like r- night terrors, bad dreams, you mm. know, that keeps you from falling asleep? Do you find that that like that you've experienced when talking with your patients? Is that like Ooh. a main? Yeah, it kind of runs the gamut. So when we think about sleep disorders, we kind of classify it and look, and especially when we think about insomnia, there's a couple different things that we look for. We look for difficulty falling asleep, difficulty staying asleep, and mm. then also difficulty um, with waking up too early. Um, waking up too early. Mm-hmm. So huh. if you wake up at like 4 a.m. but you want to get up at 7 and just no matter no matter what or you wake up at you know, two in the morning but you don't need to be up until eight and you're just mm. lying there and there's no possible way you can go back to sleep oh. that's an that's a version of insomnia as well um with my patients with trauma it kind of runs the whole gamut depending on what their traumatic event was so um for example i've worked with uh, a person before who was actually um, assaulted while they were asleep oh. and so there is a lot of difficulty in just getting in the bed and then obviously uh uh, symptoms rise up and then get, it gets activated. And that is probably one of the most severe and like harder things to treat with insomnia is if a trauma occurred to you while you were in bed asleep. Sure. Um, but otherwise, you know, I have, um, I've had many patients who have just experienced a trauma and, you know, they have, when they're going to bed and like they're lying there, their thoughts are racing a million miles an hour. Um, other times where they wake up from a nightmare or a night terror and then just can't go back to sleep. Um, and this is a longer conversation, but what ends up happening for people with sleep problems is that when you stay in bed awake, whether that's lying there and letting your thoughts go and they're kind of just taking you on a journey, or you wake up in the middle of the night and stay in bed awake, our brains are really great at creating an association with things. Mm. So your brain creates an association between being in bed and being awake. And then it's kind of like driving on a dirt road. If you drive on the same path on a dirt road over and over and over again, you do that for years, which many people with mental health issues do. Um, you know, if something is chronic, it's been navi- they've been navigating it they for keep years. keep driving on dirt roads. Yeah, you <laughs> get on a fucking highway. Yeah, come on, come on, move to LA. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically what happens is you get stuck in the same ruts. Your tires create a rut, takes a pathway, and then it's hard to drive out of that. Mm-hmm. So your brain creates this association that when you are in bed, you're awake. Um, maybe, maybe some listeners who have sleep issues have noticed that they can fall asleep on the couch really easily yes. watching TV. And then my wife, and but she doesn't listen to this podcast. <laughs> Maybe it's I'm on it. Uh, <laughs> um, but And then as soon as you get off the couch and go into bed, wide awake. Mm-hmm. That's insomnia. And that's your brain saying, hey, it's a really great place to be awake in bed. And then, you're, then you need my help. Uh, <laughs> that makes sense. You know, that's really interesting because that's you've described some things that happen to me. I wake up in the middle of the night. My brain is racing. I can't go back to sleep. Um, I end up in bed for 12, 13 hours, but feel tired. You have a pretty low rate of return. Yeah, and uh, and I fall asleep on the couch ridiculously easily. Um, it's it's as though, yeah, like you said, low rate of return. I'm not getting restorative sleep. Absolutely. But I dream, and I dream very vividly. Ah, the REM cycles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so you have REM cycles, but you're not getting, you're not feeling restored when you wake. Right. Right. So everybody has REM cycles. So right. so no matter if you were to fall asleep and only sleep 20 minutes or even just only sleep two hours, you would go through all four stages of sleep, no matter what, no matter if you are sleeping, you're going to get all four stages huh. unless you have some sort of like really, really rare underlying medical disorder that prevents you from going into a certain type of sleep stage. But that is extraordinarily rare. So everybody will get all four stages. Um, the difference with insomnia is if you're waking up really frequently is that those stages are going to be interrupted and then we don't consider, um, interrupted restorative sleep. So if you are having, you're waking up all the time, those cycles are getting interrupted, then it's not going to be your most refreshing restorative sleep. Hey friends, Brad and I started Batshit because we needed someone to talk to about our bipolar. So when looking for a sponsor, better help was the obvious choice. BetterHelp provides access to therapists via text, via Zoom, via email, via phone call, 24 hours, seven days a week. I don't need to tell anyone how broken the American healthcare system is, especially when it comes to mental illness. But the beautiful thing about BetterHelp is that they'll work with you. Go to www.betterhelp.com backslash batshit. You'll get 10% off for the first month and you'll get someone to talk to right now. If you need to talk to someone, do it. Please. We love you. 
Please like, subscribe, and share it on social media. If you have someone you think may need to hear it, we encourage you to share it with them and to start your own conversation about mental health. Um, okay, so no matter what, you're, you're experiencing those REM. So talk to us about the benefits of REM cycles with sleep. Yeah, REM cycles. So um, every stage of sleep is important. So you, there's four, N1, N2, N3, and REM. And you start with N1 and then go through them in order and then get to REM. Mm-hmm. REM is the sleep stage where your brain waves are most similar to when you're awake. Your brain is really active. Okay. Uh, and so your REM cycle is when you're going to be having those dreams that you were talking about. Like that is when you are dreaming. Mm-hmm. If you've ever like seen like your, your partner Partner or your kids sleeping, um, and they're like their eyes are shut, and they're you can like you can see their eyes like um, underneath their eyelids moving pretty rapidly. Mm. That is them in REM. That's the rapid eye movement. Um, so there's uh, the benefits of getting like REM sleep is you again you need all four. It is not your most restorative sleep stage though. That's actually N three, your deep sleep stage. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Is are there people that are more likely to go straight to REM? You know what I mean? Like, well, not bypass, obviously. You're not going to bypass it, but spend less time in a deep sleep state. Yeah, absolutely. You can. You can. Um, and there, I don't know if there's anything, like, that we've quantified that people are going to be less likely. Like, oh, because you have X, Y, Z, you're more likely to not spend time in N3. Mm. Um, we do know that people who have um, nightmares or night terrors um, uh, actually spend more time in REM, and therefore they're likely to get more nightmares, more frequent nightmares, um, and more severe, actually. The intensity of the nightmares is more frequent, or is more intense as well. What about positive dreams? Is it the same situation? They're more likely to spend more time in REM? So this is when we think about like nightmares. Like, it's like We don't actually typically study people who are having good dreams. Um, <laughs> hey, I mean, they're people too. Baby. I know they are. I mean, I got, I discriminate apparently <laughs> get canceled. Um, but, uh, no, we're like the research is looking at people who are having nightmares um, and, and they're going to have more, if they're not getting good sleep. So this is with going back to my trauma background for people, or even, you know, like thinking about how frightening <coughs> episodes of mania are, like you're talking about your friend, um, you know, those are, that can be a very traumatic experience. When people then have nightmares, what ends up happening, or they're not getting good sleep, when they're not rested, when you do sleep, you're going to be spending more time in REM, and it's like a really awful like catch-22, is you're not feeling well, but you're going to get more nightmares, and they're going to be more frequent. Good God. That's awful. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We talk about, you're talking about trauma, and, and Brad came up with this great uh, analogy a couple episodes ago that I, I just absolutely love. Or maybe you didn't. Maybe you stole it off the internet. I'm not going to judge you. <laughs> but uh, you talked about uh, the broken leg situation where right. you, you break your leg, right? And your leg is broken. And you're like, ow, oh, my leg is broken. But then you see somebody who uh, doesn't, uh, um, it, both of his legs are broken. Or now he's in a wheelchair. And you're like, oh, my trauma isn't that bad because look at that guy. And then that guy sees someone who was born without legs. And it's like, oh my God, I'm not that bad. And it just spirals, and now you're not treating the trauma. And because you're not treating the trauma, it's affecting every aspect of your life that goes far beyond uh, uh, just what's associated with that trauma. And that's awful and horrendous. And I just like that analogy, Brad, so I brought it up again. You know, that's part of the stigma with mental illness, too, Absolutely. is yeah. people will constantly tell you that. Well, it could be worse. Mm. Right, yeah, exactly. You Guys, know. it could totally be worse. You think don't about have it as bad as this person. Right, think of all the starving kids in the various parts of the world. You know yeah. what I mean? It's Yeah, and, and that's BS, you guys. If, if you feel how you fucking feel, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. So deal with it. Um, there it is. I've solved your problem. Just deal with it. <laughs> uh, that's the end of the show, you guys. We're going to sign off. My uh, profession's <laughs> done. Yeah. Yeah, 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 just fixed it. Fixed just it. deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so c- can you... Like, obviously, seeing a therapist, dealing with a head-on is the dream, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's what you should be doing. Are there anything, is there anything that people can do to mitigate some of the uh, sleep uh, symptoms yeah. that they're having? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're not going to like them, though. Oh, great. Uh, <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> so, yes. If I don't like most of what we say, Katie, you should read the comments we get. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, good. Uh, great. Um, yes, I have a few, like, bullet point take home things that can help you all sleep better. Um, what I will say, just like any therapy change is hard. Um, and making changes is difficult. And the, so the, 
recommended treatment for sleep issues or insomnia these days is not medication. It is behavioral. Um, many of the medications for treating sleep issues are really addictive and have long-term consequences. Right, like yeah. uh, melatonin. Like I know, Oh like, my God, don't get me started on yeah, melatonin. melatonin. Because I know kids who are on melatonin, and I'm like, well, that's not, no, that's not I good. was given trazodone. Oh yeah, mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. help with sleep. Yep, um, and I I felt I haven't taken it in a bit because I felt like it was making me sleep longer, making me groggy. Mm-hmm. But that actually hasn't changed, right? So even I though mean, you're yeah. not on yeah. go back to <laughs> taking the trazodone. I do feel like my wakeful period in the middle of the night was shorter. Oh, good. Okay, when I was on it. Okay. Yeah, um, so trazodone, um, yeah, there, and that can also help with nightmares as well, or uh, that's the hope with the off-label. Um, that one's less, like, I think about addictive, but I think about people who have been taking Ambien for years. Mm. Um, if you guys haven't seen it, you should look up the Ambien Walrus comic. Um, it's very, very funny. The Ambien Walrus The Ambien comic? Walrus, yeah. Uh, big fan. <laughs> I don't even know what it is, and I'm already a big fan. Yes, yeah, so basically, it's a walrus who's going to take you on an adventure you'll never remember, which is Ambien. <laughs> Um, really addictive and really hard to get off of. Um, and we know through actually lots of research now that behavioral intervention is the best way to treat sleep. Um, and I can actually, I do have something I did want to say about melatonin um, first before I get into the other ones. You should have seen her, her like her teeth grind and her eyes light up with rage the yeah. second I mentioned melatonin. Everybody. <laughs> so melatonin, um, for, uh, what the caveat is if something is working for you, do what is working for you. Like don't change because you hear me like a random person. Um, but I don't think anybody's ever listened to our podcast and turned their life around. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I okay. mean, they, they just sit there and go, oh, me too. Cool. <laughs> okay, <man." laughs> cool. Um, but what happens with melatonin is first of all, it's really not regulated. So there's been a lot of um, studies recently that have done independent testing of melatonin where they look at the amount that's in like whether that's a gummy or whatever and it ranges wildly. So you could be getting way under what you think you're taking, but worse, and what happens most frequently is you're getting way, way, way over the amount that you think that you're taking. Um, and that's actually can kind of be dangerous because melatonin is a hormone and your body is creating the hormone. And then you get all sorts of things that gets disrupted when you're throwing way too much hormones. Well, wait, does that mean that it's not FDA regulated? Of course. Yeah. No, it's Mel- a supplement. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, see, I don't take melatonin. I yeah. did not know. Well, um, I encourage you to not start, um, <laughs> but um, what ends up happening with melatonin is that um, there's actually a, a book uh, Matthew Walker wrote. It's called Why We Sleep that I would recommend. I think uh, I've heard of that book. Yeah, yeah. It's a good one. Um, but he gives this great um, description of melatonin as, as like uh, if you think of a official, like an Olympic official who's like regulating a track race, mm-hmm. the melatonin is the official with the gun that makes the gun go off so people start the race, but it doesn't help you run the race at all. It is a cue for your brain to start producing more melatonin Mm. that helps you with your sleep process, but it doesn't help you sleep any better. And importantly, if you are going to take melatonin, you have to take it at least two hours before you go to sleep. Uh, If you start to, if you're laying in bed going, God, this isn't happening for me tonight, and then take melatonin, what's going to happen is it's going to start working about two to three hours later, and you're going to be really groggy in the morning. That's not helpful at all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So, so sorry, uh, I got off the track. No, it's all right. We do a lot of tangential <laughs> okay. uh on this yes. show. Uh, so please uh, go back to your suggestions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's um, there's a few different ones, and I'll kind of place them into different categories. Um, and I'll talk about sleep hygiene in a moment. But the kind of the biggest recommendations that I could give you that will help your sleep um, is the first one is to have a regular schedule. And why that? I mean a regular wake-up time. Um, sleep is controlled by two biological processes in human beings. The first is called your um, sleep drive, and the other is called your circadian rhythm, otherwise known as your um, circadian clock or your biological clock. Um, Your sleep drive is basically a hunger for sleep that you accumulate throughout the day. Uh, boiling that down to the longer you are awake, the more you would like to sleep. Mm. Um, Your circadian rhythm is a clock in your brain, basically. It regulates a bunch of different, um, multiple processes inside your body. But if we're thinking about sleep, this clock runs on a 24-hour and 15-minute cycle. And the best best thing you can do to help get your circadian rhythm back in line is to wake up at a specific time and keep that time every morning. Um, Mm. You don't have to do this necessarily forever, but if you're struggling with sleep issues now, 
what time you need to wake up at, like think about that. Like for me, it's around six and then wake up at six every day, no matter how poorly a uh, night of sleep you've had the night before that will tell your circadian rhythm. Cause when you have sleep issues as well as other mental health disorders, what happens is those two processes get really out of whack. They get really unaligned um, and you need to get them kind of back on track in order to sleep better. Okay. So biggest cue for your circadian rhythm we have a regular schedule. What that does, if you wake up at the same time every day, it tells your brain to A, stop producing melatonin, start producing the hormones that kind of keep you alert and awake throughout the day. And actually, as you sit up, it's actually a big cue. Um, your like the body alignment actually helps your brain cue those biological processes in releasing hormones, as well as getting light in the day, but don't get me started on daylight savings time. Oh, um, <laughs> bread. That's more bread. Yeah. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, um, wait, so you're, so, so to clarify, not clarify, you said it very well, but to reiterate, so you're saying wake up and get the fuck out of bed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yep. don't just wake up at 8 o'clock and then be like, I did it. Yep. Like, oh, up. you're getting ahead of me with my other recommendations. Oh, damn it. Sorry. I'm <laughs> you're stealing my job. God. <laughs> so rude of I you. I already solved all everyone's <laughs> mental health issues. Yes. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. That's what I'm here for. Um, so that's that's the first one is to get out of bed at a regular schedule. Uh, regular bedtime is helpful, too. Um, but most importantly is a regular wake-up time. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one, so as you, we call it stimulus control, is the uh, like medical term for what you just talked about, is not staying in bed while you are awake. It is one of the biggest things you can do. It's kind of like um, unplugging your computer, plugging it back in again, doing like a hard reboot. Uh, I guess I talked earlier about how your brain has created an association with being in bed and being awake. Mm. So never, ever, ever stay in bed awake longer than about 15 or 20 minutes or so. Um, If you are lying in bed, whether that's when you're going to sleep or you wake up in the middle of the night and you're having a hard time falling back asleep, First things first, lie quietly, see if that happens. But if it's been about 15 or 20 minutes, get out of bed. And what this is going to do is going to help break that association between your brain um, and being awake in bed. And what I recommend is just doing some sort of like quiet activity until you're sleepy again. It could be like light housework. It could be um, watching a familiar TV show. Maybe the brightness like turned down a little bit, but something until you're sleepy again, and then go back to bed once you feel that tiredness hit and rinse and repeat if you need to. That's usually the one where my patients tell me that they were cursing my name for a few weeks while I was starting. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, um, it, like getting my wife off the couch when she's starting to fall asleep is impossible. Oh it's yeah. Like I'm, I, I, I'd have to physically move her. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's that's one of the hardest ones. Um, and then, so that's stimulus control. Basically, you want to make your bed a place for sleep and sex only. Right. Um, if you and then for what's the what's tough about this is that if you don't have insomnia, if you don't struggle with it, like I I don't. Um, my husband does though. Like I could watch TV in bed, I could eat in bed, whatever, and I would be totally fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and fall asleep, stay asleep. Um, but if you have insomnia, all this makes you sensitive to these things. So you have to do unfortunately more to see and that's the problem because as we've discussed in the past the bed is the best place to eat taco bell <laughs> yeah yeah so completely you're oh. taking away joy Katie. i'm sorry you're yeah moving joy from people's lives <laughs> now you've talked about brad in, in the past that you, you when you've had a similar issue to not being able to fall asleep you tend not to get up because you feel like it reawakens you right you've mentioned that yeah but maybe that's the idea maybe uh you know, I was uh, actually watching videos last night on biphasic sleep. Mm, oh, interesting. The idea of uh, second sleep. Mm. Uh, that <clears throat> apparently there's uh, evidence in the historical record that people used to go to sleep. They'd wake up in the middle of the night, get up, do a few things, and then go back to sleep. Mm. And they'd call it first sleep and second sleep. Um, and I was kind of wondering about that because I, I do. I wake up in the middle of the night and I I... I don't know how long I lay there, but it feels mm-hmm. like an hour yeah, or more. Um, and I've been wondering if maybe I should get up and do something. Um, but of course, the initial things my brain goes to is like turn on the television or play a video game. Right. Because mm-hmm. that's too stimulating. Yeah. You know? It's a fine line, right? Like Again, I wouldn't recommend like the latest action movie that's really going to draw you in. But if you have like a, a background TV show you've seen a bunch of times, turn yeah. off, turn the brightness down and go for it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And of course, I can see why people would curse your name when trying to do this because you're, you're trying to develop a habit, right, yeah. guys mm-hmm. and girls? And that's really hard to do. Uh, yes. We've talked about in other episodes uh, developing positive habits, everything from like eating correctly to working out to 
Now Katie's burdening you with sleep. I mean, <laughs> it's going to suck, but if it it's going to be better than the alternative. And and that's the, the the big thing is I talk about with my patients a lot. Like for and I think it, you guys have touched on this already, but that it's more than about getting a good night of sleep, right? Like sleep affects so much in your lives and you know whether you have the energy to engage with your kids or you know for your work, whatever that may be. Um, you think about what's most important to you and then how not sleeping well impacts that then you have the motivation to like maybe kind of do some of these things that are harder. Um, that's how I always start my sessions is, you know, what's, what's important to you? How is that being affected by your sleep loss? Mm. Um, and that being said, so, so the particular um, brand of like sleep treatment I do, which is the like gold standard recommended, it's called uh, CBTI um, or cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And it's a five session treatment. So I work again, I work so with just five sessions, five sessions. So it's, it's, um, it kind of sounds like seven minute abs, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, it doesn't... <laughs> and that's, what's amazing about it is like I do PTSD treatment and it takes people months, if not years to heal from trauma. Um, sleep treatment is one of my, like a, PTSD is very fulfilling um, of treating that with me, uh, for, for me. Sleep is something so helpful for me to treat because I get to see people get better and like a fuck ton better in five weeks. Um, and their whole lives are changed. And wow. it's pretty, wow. it's, it's really like when I'm in the stuck in like the, oh my gosh, this is taking forever for my patients with like really severe PTSD to feel better. Just get over the war. Just, <laughs> yeah. Just stop it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then I get to go and do some sleep treatment and be like, it works. <laughs> it's so much better. And it's so like, it, uh, it helps for like a, a rainy day as a therapist. But like, yeah, like it's like, I get people like, yeah, I didn't like you the first week when you had me doing all this stuff. But week five, you're my new best friend. And wow. that's pretty incredible to feel. Five weeks. Wow. That's, yeah. That's all. And when you consider you spent, you're supposed to spend a third of your life asleep. Mm -hmm. Uh, do your best to fix this. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you have to. And the fact that you can change that around in such a short amount of time is fantastic. Yeah. I love the irony of this episode that I've been yawning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Brad's got a little nightcap on. You guys can't yeah. see if you're not watching the video version of it. So so the other thing, my other like kind of my last recommendation before I would get into like sleep hygiene stuff, which is pretty minimal, would be to whatever you do, don't compensate for a lack or a night of poor sleep. And by that, I mean, don't do things like taking a nap in the middle of the day uh, or taking a nap whenever naps are one of the things that bring your sleep drive down or the hunger to sleep. Um, mm. It interrupts that and brings it down throughout the day. So that when you go to bed, you have less drive to sleep. Um, so not taking a nap, um, but not doing things like having caffeine late in the day, um, not going to bed earlier because you are sleepy or staying in bed later. So if you, so are there no benefits to those things or is it just that it F's with your sleep? It depends on if you have insomnia or if you have right, sleep, sleep right, difficulties, right, right, right. right? So if you don't have sleep difficulties, it might be okay to do those things. Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel bad saying this. I could take a nap and, and I could fall, like I take a nap in the middle of the day and mm. I could go to bed and be fine. But right. I don't have insomnia. I don't have sleep huh. issues. But for people who do have insomnia, what it's doing, I talked about those biological process, processes, your homeostatic sleep drive, it's interrupting that. It's almost like... Um, Say you like imagine sleep is like a piggy bank um, and you need, this is a myth, but say you need eight hours of sleep per night. Okay. Um, so what you're doing then if you take a nap, so you take a one hour nap in the middle of the afternoon, you withdraw a dollar. You'll say like, so now you have seven hours, seven dollars left in your sleep piggy bank. So when you go to bed at night, you're only going to get seven, but you needed eight. Oh, gotcha. Huh. Interesting. Well, yeah. then you had talked about sleep debt. You mentioned that. Is that akin to what that is, or? Uh, so so no sleep debt would be like when you're getting chronically chronically le uh, less sleep than you need, and mm. then you kind of like sleep a ton to kind of make up for it. Yeah. Um, but this would be where you're just screwing up your sleep drive, so you're not giving yourself like you're not keeping it full for when you go to bed at night. Uh, I understand. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. Huh. Also, actually, to to go back to um like. Would be I said that eight hours of sleep is a myth. I don't think I want to clarify that. Um, so um, there is a um, range. So most people hear like pop culture that you need eight hours of sleep. Sorry, one second, guys. I'm gonna shut my dogs up. That's how powerful I am. They couldn't see me. I just stood up and they stopped. 
Sorry. You were saying, Katie. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, again, pop culture, it kind of tells you that everybody needs eight hours of sleep. But it's actually kind of the average, and more people fall in a range from about six to nine hours. It's typically where people fall. Again, what I'll say, though, is that sometimes mental health disorders will shake that up. But if you're trying and aiming very specifically for eight hours and it just doesn't feel like it's working for you, that might not be where you fall in that range. Well, how do you discern that, then? Ah, you come to me. Um, and you, <laughs> well, the, the, the biggest thing, what you do... Um, We're is not you, vets, Katie. We can't come to you. <laughs> yes. In a year, I'm going to open a private practice. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Um, but what you want to do is track your sleep. Um, there's things called a, a sleep diary that you can find online for free um, and track your sleep. And what you'll see is like you'll be able to track like how much sleep you're getting. And then really all you need to do is figure out, which is like harder said than done, but where do you feel like you feel rested? Um, mm-hmm. So if you're starting out with sleep treatment, we also start on this like the smaller end, like six hours, and then work your way up. If you hit seven hours, and you're like, oh, yeah, I actually feel pretty rested. But you notice that you go to seven and a half or eight, and you're like, I'm starting to feel a little groggy. Mm. That is your cue that actually seven hours is kind of where you should be. Mm. Like, for example, huh. I'm at six. I, I feel really well rested at six. My husband doesn't get nine. All bets are off. Uh, sure. Yeah, so sure. I feel like I'm a, I'm a, you know, like, probably eight plus yeah i don't think i yeah six isn't gonna do it for me you think you're i don't know it's so difficult to tell because i stay in bed so long mm. um which you know a big part of is the depression well then yeah depression but, makes it that, that throws a whole other thing into this you know is so you could be getting decent sleep but then you have depression on top of that and then you're going out in the day and you're like one of that's one of the symptoms of depression is like chronic fatigue right right um yeah. as well as concentration difficulties you know a memory impairment that you all were talking about earlier so then you add comorbidity on top of it and then it's hard we <laughs> yeah. mental disorder yeah i'm tired and the best way i can describe it is all the time i feel heavy and slow yeah yeah when i'm trying to move yeah yeah that's ex- yeah Absolutely. yeah, so, yeah I, always, I always equate it to like you're you're slogging through a bog mm. you know what yeah. i mean you're not walking mm-hmm. on solid ground it's more like you're trying to wade through quicksand type of bog thing. slog bog, bog slog, slog yeah. you're in a bog <laughs> slog that's our new band. Like <laughs> uh, Think of the bog of sadness from the never ending story. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. That's how I describe depression to my patients is the bog that. of sadness. That's basically that. what it is. Yeah. I haven't seen yeah. that movie in so long. Does it's it for, it's a trip. It, it, it it's up? crazy to watch it again. I really like it. But um, the other thing I'll say that I probably should have said earlier is before doing any of these recommendations, one of the biggest things you can do is make sure that you don't have any underlying medical conditions, in particular, sleep apnea. So mm. a lot of times, and people think that people with sleep apnea are like middle-aged or like um 70 plus men who have like heart disease on the, it feels like a very particular um view of people who have sleep apnea very very young fit healthy people have um uh, insomnia or sleep, sorry sleep apnea and so what you want to do what happens if you have sleep apnea is you're not getting enough oxygen while you're sleeping which so you're not breathing well which makes it so that you are never ever no matter how much sleep you're getting getting a restored night of sleep so, so you oh. cut a hole in your chest and you, <laughs> you just dab a straw into your lung and that'll help with sleep apnea yeah exactly i did it i did it guys it keeps yes. solving everyone's problems <laughs> Sorry, no, go on. But if you're feeling like you're getting a good sleep or like you're getting enough, um, but you're feeling really chronically tired throughout the day, my biggest recommendation is to see if you have sleep apnea. Because what will happen is you'll get, because um, you're just not getting enough oxygen. And if you have sleep apnea um, that goes untreated for a, a while, you're actually at a much, much higher risk of heart disease. Because mm. um, you're just not getting enough oxygen and we right. need sleep. So how do you test for sleep apnea? Yeah, you have, like, yeah. go to a doctor type of thing? No, so you, you, you'll talk to your PCP or your primary care physician and they will refer you to a sleep study and usually it'll be a first one's like an at-home one where they'll send you home and they like you, you like hook up things to your fingers and stuff and they record whether you have we call them apneic events which means it means that you stop breathing oh. and then they diagnose you with sleep apnea and sometimes you have to go in for an in-person um like sleep like in where you're sleeping in like a clinic, but usually just diagnosed at home. Mm. And then you get a CPAP machine, um, which are that machine that makes you sound like Darth Vader. Right? They're like, way oh. better now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're way, way more advanced than they used to be. Um, but yes, yeah, so it basically gives you oxygen. Mm. Um, and that will w- make a world of difference. So if you're sleeping with somebody and they've ever commented that you snore, um, go get a sleep test. 
like snoring is a big cue that you have sleep apnea um, eventually, especially if you stop breathing at all. Um, but, um, that's one of my big things. Make sure you treat any underlying sleep conditions, but sleep apnea is so, so prominent. Sure. I see so many very, very young people, um, like in their early twenties getting diagnosed with sleep apnea and they're like super fit and everything. So that's take sad. care of yourselves guys. No heart disease. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Heart <laughs> disease. F that. F yeah. that noise. Heart disease. <laughs> um, Katie, this has been awesome. Uh, Brad, do you have any additional questions for Katie? I feel like we could talk to her for hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I don't have any additional questions right now. But I'm sure, but, we'll come up with some. Yeah, <laughs> but we'll definitely have you back to talk about this again because I find sleep to be absolutely fascinating, and the uh, how detrimental it is not to be getting it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's your body, it's your mind, and we're a podcast that deals with uh, your mind. So if you're not treating your mind with your sleep, um, you're basically doing yourself a huge disservice. And it's something that. While Katie said that it's five weeks and you're going to hate Katie for all five weeks. No, just for the first like one or two. Eh, eh, <laughs> all, right. all right. We'll give Katie the benefit of the doubt. Well, the first one or two. Um, it's something that you can do that is active, that is going to help you with your diagnosis. That's going to help you it with your issues well. yeah. that it's within your control. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that's an illusion that a lot of us have is when we struggle with sleep that Something's wrong with me. I can't do anything about it. But mm. you can do something about it. As Katie just mentioned, there's a, there's a lot of like steps you can take. And if it's something that doesn't require any money, it doesn't require, or, I mean, maybe eventually you got to go see Katie and that'll cost some money. But the, the tips that she suggested uh, don't cost anything and they're an active way for you to try and help yourself and uh, help those around you if you snore. So, yeah. I have some free apps and everything I can Ooh, give you guys apps. that you guys can download. Go, too. go, go. Free yeah. apps. Mm-hmm. I like free apps. What, what are they? Oh, it's CBTI coach. It's built for veterans, but you all can use it. It's probably the easiest thing to use. That'll... CBTI coach. Yes. Okay. I can send it to you as well. Um, but that is really easy to help track your sleep, see what's going on and then start implementing the things they're recommending. Um, so I can send all that over, but that's, that's awesome. a big one is CBTI coach. Yeah. yeah let's see. That's super cool. Uh, look at Katie. Oh, and also, um, if you're noticing racing thoughts while you are falling asleep, the, my biggest thing is to do a meditation, um, a mindfulness meditation, particularly the one I would recommend that you can YouTube any free meditation. There's so many on there. It's called Leaves on a Stream, and that is particularly helpful in managing racing thoughts when you're fa- trying to fall asleep. Yeah. So stop listening to all those creepy ASMR people on YouTube <laughs> and listen to the stream. Um, Awesome. Katie, thank you so much for being on. This was really cool and really fun. Uh, I hope to have you on again. Uh, Absolutely. All those people out there who are fighting and working on their sleep, uh, keep fighting. Mm -hmm. Keep fighting. We love you.